Divine is also the executive director for Corrective Gentlemen, a nonprofit program that highlights the importance of mentorship, entrepreneurship, and advocacy. Today, Divine will be talking about the power and importance of education. Please help me welcome our last speaker, Divine Lipscomb. Good evening. Oh, man. Thank you for coming out. So, you guys heard a lot today about change. The theme of the, the state of state this year is change. The state of change. But what does that really mean, right? I'm going to get right into it. So for education, we use that as a tool to gear us towards uh, the most profitable and sustainable uh, life that we will want. Most people, especially in elementary, junior high school, uh, have teachers and educators who push them towards uh, their dreams, their desires. Most of us here in this audience never had to question whether or not we were going to uh, end up here in Penn State. But what we don't think about is the school to prison pipeline, where most of our young black men and brown men are shuffled into the criminal justice system. They are five times more likely to enter into the juvenile justice system than their white counterparts. I bring this up because at the age of 14, I found myself convicted of a felony. I, I'm a native New Yorker, right? So let, let me back that up a little bit. I'm born and raised in New York. And in 1993, my life changed just a little bit. Well, not just a little bit. What we know about families and crime and the risky behaviors that gear people towards crime is family disruption, alcohol, substance abuse, uh, environmental factors. Those five, uh, five times more likely individuals who uh, I mentioned on the other slide, they experienced the same things that I did. My mom, uh, who's in the audience tonight, is probably the most powerful woman that I've ever met uh, because she survived some things. And, and her going through her life struggles, I had to survive some things. Uh, my stepfather entered into our life around 1993, and you know, he, he, he brought some, some baggage with him. You know, he was addicted to his various drugs, and he was abusive. And so I didn't have room to go to school and think about whether or not I wanted to study. I don't care about books. Uh, I need to make sure my mom is good. I need to make sure my siblings are good. And when we look at our teachers and our educators, it's that zero tolerance policy. You need to read this. You need to do that. Never take it for a second that this child may be hungry. This child may be in a household where there's violence and alcohol dependency, or as we'd like to say, substance abuse. Uh, disorder. These things directly correlate with the fact that a higher number of juveniles enter into our criminal justice system. These same juveniles, within a year of being suspended from school, will be incarcerated. They go from being in juvenile detention to our local and state facilities. Just right up the block from us, I'm not sure if you guys are even aware of this, we have two state facilities, one county jail, and one of five detention centers, juvenile detention centers, that, by the way, are privately funded. They are not even state run. No oversight. These kids, who barely can make rational decisions, 
are shuffled in and out of our juvenile justice system, our criminal justice system, with no hopes of ever ending up here on Penn State campus. I moved here about 10 years ago after being rescued from the streets of New York. And I, I, I worked in local restaurants. Uh, the auto port was one of them. And I was given a chance to succeed, pretty much. But before I got here, I, I, I decided I was going to go to school. Uh, I had my GED in hand because I was a minor inside of a, a, an adult facility, and we were forced to go to school. And, but life as an adult learner, even at 24 years old, was different. I had, I had to work, but I couldn't work. I couldn't find a job. Uh, when I applied for school, the same box that I had found myself checking off on job applications uh, was on my admissions form. Have you ever been convicted of a felony? I mean, yeah, I'm from Brooklyn. Everybody I know is convicted of a felony. Like, that's, that's almost a no-brainer. But I didn't understand what that had to do with education. What does me being convicted of a felony have to do with me finding, uh, getting this in education and, and helping myself transform into a better individual? Why is it that if society says we want to reintegrate our, our, our prison population uh, back into society, that something as powerful and as important as education will stand in this way? So what? I had a felony. I want to go get an education. I'm going to put that down for a second, because what we seem to forget is that we all have the same goals in life, right? We want to raise our family. We want to find success. And if you take that away from an individual who has historically been deprived the rights to basic things, education, equitable housing, things of that nature, and then say, hey, here you go. Go back into the world. Do your thing. We're not going to help you anymore. You just have to figure this out. Socially, economically, that is not responsible. We continue to raise the recidivism rates. We continue to pay more in taxes. We built more jails. These things end up messing with our economy. Not only does it mess up our economy, we create more avenues for individuals to go back to jail. Why? Because my dad is no longer here. He's back in a prison cell, so my mom is now single, and she has to work all day, every day, alone, by herself, and I'm left to fend for myself. So then that leaves me with extra time on my hands. I can do whatever it is that I please. Peer, peer, Association is one of the leading causes for uh, juveniles to get into trouble. There's no one around. Pennsylvania, ooh, Pennsylvania. On the East Coast, we are one of the leading states in incarceration. One of the leading states. That's problematic, simply because there are 24 Penn State Commonwealth campuses. I'm, I'm going to say that again. There's 24 Commonwealth Penn State campuses. For each of those 24 Commonwealth campuses, within a stone throwing distance, is a correctional facility. So, what does that say? We have a responsibility, right? Not only to those communities that we decide to build these jails and that we put our university in that are historically underrepresented, we have a responsibility to go back, to educate, to inform, to go into these prisons. Go into these prisons. So just yesterday, or well, actually this past week, I found myself in the middle of a prison education summit. Uh, the brainchild of Professor 
Ephraim Aramon of the Restorative Justice Initiative. I'm not sure if any of you even know about the Restorative Justice Initiative, and if you do not, let me explain to you what it is. It is an organization that takes our resources into our local facilities and then empowers individuals to transform their lives. Legal literacy, arts, creative arts. I heard someone talk about creative arts earlier. And Pride and Choices. We, we, we assist with our local uh, Pride and Choices organization. Why, why is this important? Because it does speak life into people. It does give individuals hope. What I found in my last year working with Ephraim Maramon is that outside of SRJI, which is a student organization, there were only about 15 to 20 grad and undergrad students who participated. 15. On a campus of 40,000 or 46. I'm going to let that sit. 40,000 students, at least five correctional facilities up the block. You see, when I got here, I was like, okay, I'm at Penn State. I'm about to, you know, have the greatest experience uh, of my life. I'm going to get involved with student organizations. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And I found that within my first semester being here, I was lost. I was alone on the campus with 40,000 students because I simply looked for a support system. I started asking professors and, and, and some of these student clubs, where are my people? And they said, oh, you can go over to the Paul Robeson uh, Cultural Center, and that's where the majority of the African-American students go. I don't want to go to the Paul Robeson Center. Uh, it's, it's a lot of children there, and I'm, no offense, I'm, I'm kind of up there in age, not that far, but enough. But I'm like, I don't want to go there. And they say, oh, well, you're an adult, adult learner. You can go to uh, Boogie. That's where the adult learning uh, center is. Well, I don't want to be there either. Where are the people who are the convicted felons? I'm sorry, Divine, we convicted felons. No one has ever openly admitted to having a felony on our campus. Statistically, one in every three black men, one in every three black men will see prison in their life. So on a campus of 40,000 students, I cannot be the only person here. It, it's impossible. So I'm going to go a little further in those statistics. One in every six Latin American, Latin American men will go to prison and one in every 17 white men. So if, even if we are at a disadvantage on a race scale, one in every 17 white men. So where are we? Why is it that a stigma of being incarcerated will keep you from seeking out the support that you need on a campus that is supposedly progressive? Why is it that as a university, we do not have comprehensive programs inside of the prison and support on, side of our, on our campuses? Why is it that someone should feel alone on a campus as huge as Penn State? Why are we muted? Is it that we fear that our counterparts, our fellow students, are going to uh, discriminate against us? Oh, that guy's a criminal. I don't want to be next to him. What did he do? Oh my God, he's really, really dangerous. Maybe five, 10, 15 years ago, or maybe I was sexually abused and I had things that I, I, I was working with. Maybe I was emotionally and physically abused and I no longer had power. And so the way I found my power was taking it out on the streets of Brooklyn. Maybe there was just something missing inside of me and I just did not know how to feel it. So when we come onto campuses like this, we have caps, there's mental health illnesses, there's things that we, we just don't seek out, right? But I can promise you in this audience, there's trauma. If 
You can't go through this life and not have trauma. But it should not hinder you from seeking your education. So since I've been here, I, I've been really, really involved in trying to build the gap between students through my vulnerability. I openly express and talk about the things that I go through. I have obtained friends because now they're like, wait, if you're willing to share this with me, I'm willing to share this with you. And it breaks down barriers. It doesn't matter if you're black, white, Hispanic, Asian. You suffered, I suffered, we're human. We bleed, we heal together. I started doing that through my education. See, my criminology course has talked about uh, punishment-based systems. It talked about how we knew systematic uh, things were in place to keep historically underrepresented communities historically underrepresented. And it was problematic. It's like, wait, you know this. Why are we not changing it? So I switched my major to rehabilitation and human services. Very, very, very quiet field. My education has allowed me to start reaching out to people who I would never have spoken to a day in my life because it allowed me to dig deep and start to heal. Who's going to heal today? Who's going to help me heal? I can help you heal because I'm open to you. Do you know how many justice impacted individuals who need to heal? I mean, after all, when we leave here as doctors, lawyers, educators, we, we, we know where we're going to be. Penn State allowed us that privilege. But with that privilege, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to disrupt systems. We have a responsibility to go back into communities, not with just our degrees, but with the knowledge that we can change people's lives. We can heal through our own vulnerabilities, through our ability to say, you know what? You're probably acting out because you've been through something. You, you're probably in this place because something happened. And how can I relate? How can I dig inside of me and, and, and do something about that? See, there's 2.2 million Americans who are currently incarcerated. 650,000 of them are released every year, thrown back into our world. without proper treatment for addiction, without being access, without having access to uh, therapy, the things that they need to begin to heal, without having access to education. Why is there a box asking about a conviction on an educational application? So what can you do about that? Juvenile justice rates can drop, ban the box options, cash bail systems. These are things that are taking place right now that we can attack as students. We can make things equitable. I'm going to task you guys. Reach out, somebody, anybody. Your neighbor, I don't know if you know your neighbor or if you're just snugged in those little tight spots. You never know who's among you. You never know who's hurting, who, who needs healing. You never know if this person is alone, justice impacted or not, suffering from addiction, was just sexually abused. Throughout edu we have a world-renowned education that allows us these tools to tap in and to tune in. We know where we're going to be. 
will I be the only person on this campus who is just as impacted as saying we are? Or will you come and help me welcome others? Thank you.